One renowned retirement expert and former Goldman Sachs banker is stepping forward and revealing his number one way to beat inflation. It's a way to receive a nearly 10% yield from the government with virtually no risk. Folks who take the three simple steps he's sharing right now could receive nearly $1,500 from the U.S. Treasury in as little as a few months. Best of all, it's guaranteed by law, and you could pay zero taxes on this low-risk investment. Consider how rapidly inflation continues to soar. You don't want to waste any time missing out on a potential profits he believes are in store for this investment. To get a copy of his new free report with all the details, simply go to BeatInflationReport.com Again, that's BeatInflationReport.com for a free copy of his new report. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's July 12th, 2022. Got a big show for you. We're going to talk about the consumer and we're going to name names. We got a whole six pack of stocks I'm going to talk about from some small cap names you may have never heard of to some big names I know you have heard of. Also, CPI coming out tomorrow, the consumer price index, inflation number. We're going to dive into that and what could drive the number and my guesstimate, let's call it, of what's going to happen. Also, why is everybody so negative right now? I want to know why. All that and more coming up right now on Making Money. Welcome again. I'm Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. This is Making Money. It is July 12th, 2022. It is a beautiful Tuesday here in South Florida. I knew today's day because yesterday is my mother's birthday. And it's funny because the oldest of five siblings, I still get a million texts from my other siblings and other relatives saying, don't forget your mother's birthday. I must have forgotten in a few years and, and, and a day late. I don't know. But there's so many damn reminders on my phone and everything. My phone was blowing up yesterday just from the reminders I set. So I was one of the first to reach out to her in the morning because I get up earlier than anybody else. So I'm happy to say at 46 years old, I am now responsible enough to know the date uh, that my mother was born. But let's jump into these markets, folks. Uh, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about the CPI coming up. That's a big number coming out tomorrow. The markets, in my opinion, are moving on that. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about Bitcoin for a moment, breaking back down below 20,000. And then we're going to dive into consumer. And as I mentioned, I got a, I got a whole handful of stocks here. I'm going to break down for you. Maybe some of you want to put your watch list. Maybe some of you want to avoid. Uh, but kind of covering all different areas of the consumer going forward and how the consumer will be affected uh, with uh, what's going on right now in the market, the jobs market, uh, inflation, interest rates, etc. But before we jump into any of that, uh, I want to take a look at the markets here right now. So let me pull up the S&P 500 and give you an idea from last week really what has happened. Here is a chart of the SPYs. Right now, we're about 35 or so minutes into the trading session here on Tuesday morning, and we're down about a quarter percent. We were up earlier. We opened lower, had a big little quick spike higher, then it came right back down. Again, we are 30 some minutes in, so uh, the first hour to me is always volatile. Uh, but what we can see here in the charts is something that's not good. And that is the fact that really since we topped out in March, we've had a series of uh, lower highs. Every spike has been a little bit lower and lower lows. Every pullback has gone to a new yearly low. So this trend is continuing. Uh, this red line, which has been an important resistance level uh, the last few months, that's the 50-day simple moving average. What that does, folks, is it takes the closing price of the last 50 trading days uh, averages it out, uh, adds it together, divides it by 50, goes, it gives you the average, and that's what that line is. So this is the average close over the last 50 trading sessions. It is a bit of a trend um, indicator that most people use, and it oftentimes can act as resistance and as support. You can see back here, uh, late last year, it was a support. It always bounced off it, and it doesn't always work exactly, but then once it breaks it, it has trouble usually getting back above it. So this area right here, about 395 on the SPY, we're at 383 ish right now. Uh, so quite a bit above it um, is going to be resistance. It is also, if I drew a downtrend line here, I'll draw this for you real quick because this is this is kind of important too to see this. If you connect this this downtrend here, uh, it's going to be very much in that similar area uh, that we saw. So let's call it right there. So that's around 392, and you can see it actually covers up. Uh, the red area there. So it's right at the same level. So that 392 level is extremely important on the SPY. We came very close to there uh, last week in June. We came very close to there last week and it failed. We break above that. That's a game changer. 
Until that's broken, the, the short-term trend, I hate to admit it, is still down because it's a series of lower highs and lower lows. It doesn't mean I think we're going to break to a new yearly low, but it is something that we must keep an eye on. Now, let me switch over real quick to the Qs, the QQQ, which is a NASDAQ 100. Very similar pattern. I'm not going to get as detailed in it, but you can see lower highs, lower lows. See how it rallied up to its 50-day moving average on Friday, failed, and now down today about two-thirds of percent, uh, about 40 minutes into the trading session on the low of the day. Uh, so last week we had uh, the technology stocks greatly outperform, and now they're giving back those gains over the last two trading sessions. You know, it's been, it's been wild. It's, there's, there's definitely a pattern here, though, as wild as it is. You have these pretty big rallies, uh, especially in the tech stocks, and then followed by a pretty big sell-off. Then another rally followed by a sell-off. Until that pattern is broken, again, this short-term trend is down. Again, I'm not saying that we're at a situation right now where this is going to go on you know, for the foreseeable future. I believe we priced in a lot of the negative news. I think we priced in at least a shallow recession, a slight recession that may last two to three quarters, a very low negative GDP growth. Nothing, you know, I don't see you know, anything more than that happening, but I believe we've priced that in already. Uh, we've obviously priced in higher interest rates because the Fed has really kind of uh, dictated exactly what they're going to do. Sure, we were surprised last meeting because they went 75 versus the 50 they anticipated because of a higher inflation number. There is a meeting here uh, in a couple of weeks in July. And that's why the next thing I talk about here, the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, which is the government's um, uh, measurement of inflation. So the CPI comes out tomorrow morning uh, and for the month of June, obviously. The estimates are for a gain uh, year over year of 8.8% versus last month was a year over year gain of 8.6%. If it comes in, it will be the highest level uh, in about 40 years. Um, so you're looking at, at, at another very high reading on the inflation number if it comes in up there. I think it probably comes in around what it was last month. Maybe it's not as high. But let me do a, a, quite of a, a bit of a breakdown here when it comes to the CPI number, because a lot of people often forget what makes up the CPI and what's actually driving that number. Uh, one of my colleagues over at Stansbury, Scott Gross, gave us a great email to our uh, editors uh, yesterday breaking down really what makes up the CPI. Housing, which is both uh, buying and renting, makes about 42.3%. So a large portion is housing prices. Transportation, 18.2. Food and beverage, 14.3. So those are the three main drivers of the um, overall CPI number. Uh, then we have the core number, which uh, takes out energy and food. So that's a bit different. But talking about the core, you know, food prices are starting to come down a bit. You may not realize it quite yet, uh, when it comes to what you're paying at the grocery store. I mean, my grocery bill this past week was crazy. Uh, it was much higher than I thought it was going to be. And then they delivered the groceries. And I was like, I think you forgot two or three bags. That's what it feels like. I get it, folks. I'm there too. Um, but food prices have been coming down. And that's because of something very simple. And I'm going to show you this in one second. You know, I, I've talked about these commodities in the past. Here's the wheat ETF, W-E-A-T. That's come down from 1250 down to 850 just in the last couple of months. Obviously, wheat goes into a lot of uh, a lot of food. Soybean, same thing. Soybeans topped at 29 and a half. Now we're down to 25 and a half. Uh, that's come down as well. Corn, uh, you can see here, topped at 30. We're now down to 24 and a half. So we've had a lot of the inputs that go into food pull back quite a bit. So that's eventually going to pull down. And as I just said, that's about 14.3 percent. We're going to move up move up the ladder this way. Transportation, 18.2 percent, and makes up a CPI. Used car prices have been a big driver of the CPI because what happened with the supply chain was brand new cars were not available uh, because of chip shortages and other things, uh, supply chain, obviously. And that led to a demand for used cars because they're available. They're already built. They're on the lots. So used car prices went up because supply and demand uh, said there was not enough supply of new cars, so they moved to used. The supply there wasn't enough when the demand increased dramatically. So higher demand, supply not keeping up, prices go higher. But eventually you hit a price where it's going to come down. And you can see that the used car prices the last couple of months have been rolling over a little bit. So that could be, again, a good sign for the CPI in the next couple of months coming down. And then lastly, housing uh, makes up 42.3%. And we know home prices have started to come down a little bit in most areas of the country. Some areas are still high, but most areas starting to come down a bit. Uh, higher mortgage rates, which is driven by the Fed raising interest rates, has made 
buying a home more expensive, which again, takes some buyers out of the market and makes you uh, not be able to afford as much as you could in the past. So you're paying a little less for the house. Less demand means you're going to have house price, home prices roll over a bit. So all three of the biggest components of CPI are starting to see some weakness, uh, starting to see some you know breaks in the levy. And I believe they're going to roll over. And a lot of it has to do with what the Fed's doing with interest rates. Because again, interest rates go to mortgage rates, which then lowers the home prices. And, and, and you're seeing it trickle down to a lot of different areas. Uh, also with transportation, let's think of oil and gas, folks. Uh, oil has pulled back. Uh, gas prices have pulled back. Let me show you the charts here. This is OIL. This tracks uh, crude oil. You can see topped out at 39.5, down to 31.28. Uh, uh, UGA is an ETF that tracks gas prices. Topped out above 80. Or now we're down to 63 and change, or around 63. So again, you're seeing these starting to roll over, but they've just started to roll over. So it may not yet be in the June number uh, that we see come out tomorrow. So if it's right around 8.6, 8.8, I'm not surprised. But you start seeing July and going forward, we really should see that the, the peak of that. The one thing I think is driving the market lower today, and, and this is just, uh, I didn't read this, this is just my my fear here is, or, or not my fear, but my, my consensus estimate of, of why it's ha happening is, remember when the market got crushed in June? That was when the Fed came out and raised interest rates 75 basis points when it thought it was going to be 50. Well, the same thing could be happening here because we have the CPI, then we have the Fed in a couple of weeks. Because if the CPI comes out hotter than expected, you're going to start seeing people saying, well, we got to do 75 again by the Fed and not everybody's pricing in 75. So we could see markets sell off on that. If we come in with a CPI below estimates and really below 8.6, uh, I really think you see the market rally because you start thinking, well, maybe the Fed's actually working. Higher interest rates are actually working, and it, it could lead to that. So tomorrow's numbers will be very important. And as you know, we don't have a show tomorrow. Uh, Thursday, we have a great interview with Meb Faber, if you don't know him, from Cambria. Uh, he's a couple ETFs. Uh, he's got a really good podcast, wrote some books. Uh, super, super smart guy. I've had him on a couple years ago. He'll be on Thursday's show, and we'll talk about that on Thursday's show. But don't forget, I always do a daily email. It's called uh, My Daily Insights. That goes out every day after the close that the stock market is open. So obviously tomorrow, one of the sections in there will be on the CPI. So if you want the immediate breakdown of what I think, uh, please do that. Also, you can follow me on Twitter. I'll do some live updates after it comes out tomorrow morning. Uh, it's Matthew McCall on Twitter as well. So that's where we stand with the CPI. Again, tomorrow is going to be a very important day for the markets. Probably volatile heading into that today. And then tomorrow, we'll probably see a lot of swinging around as people try to anticipate what the Fed's going to do based off the CPI number. So I want to talk about the consumer because a lot of what I just talked about is the consumer price index, how much consumers are paying to live, housing, food, gasoline, automobiles, etc. And I, I got to tell you, you know, there's something that's going on recently in this country that, you know, in my 46 years, I've never noticed. Speaking of some older people, they, they say the same thing. And I know you can go back really every decade and find something that people are pissed off about, uh, whether it's the economy, whether it's politics. Uh, it could be anything. It could be your sports teams suck. That's a lot of my life, being a Philadelphia fan. But the negativity that I see right now, um, and I've been in the U U.S. majority of the summer, about a little bit, but I even felt it when I was overseas. And the negativity that surrounds people. When you go ask somebody, hey, how's your day? Hey, how you been? It's not, I've been great. How about you? You know, things are good. Having a great summer so far. Kids are healthy. Got in travel. No. It's, yo, I went on vacation. Uh, gas prices are so high. I can't believe how much we paid for food. Uh, politicians suck. I mean, it's just, it's, I'd say it's not the 80-20 rule. It's like the 90-10 rule. 90% 90 of the stuff that comes out of people's mouth is so damn negative. And I almost feel like this is a self-fulfilling prophecy, what we're creating right now. Sure, the stock market has to pull back. It doesn't go up all the time. Sure, the economy has to pull back. It doesn't go straight up. Recessions happens, bear markets happen. I get it. I'm not saying that this shouldn't be happening right now. But the fact that we continue to be negative day after day, we start convincing ourselves that things are so much worse than they really are. I was watching CNBC yesterday, which... Honestly, I watch once every three weeks for maybe an hour. I just happen to have it on my desk while I was working. I don't know why I had it on. I had the sound on for some, whatever reason I turned it on. 
And it was a halftime show with uh, Scott Wapner is the host. And it, it was, I had to tweet out at it and Scott Wapner tweeted back at me uh, because it was so embarrassing to watch. It was so disgusting and negative. I mean, what he was doing to the guests is horrible because CNBC lives off one thing and their ratings are terrible, folks. Just so you know, I was on TV. I know their ratings. They're absolutely horrific. The ratings are terrible, but they have to get money in from advertising. So they have to be extreme one way or the other. Most news stations are like this, uh, opinion news stations, whether it's Fox News on the right or whether it's MSNBC on the left. Uh, they all do it. Uh, they're all guilty of it. But they sensationalize things and it has to be crazy. Scott Wapner is so damn negative, making it sound like the world's ending. Jim Leventhal, who used to come on my show at Fox Business back in the day, I don't know him very well. I don't want to say hello to him. And I don't have an opinion of him or one way or the other. But I was watching him speak yesterday, folks, and he was basically saying, hey, not everything's horrible out there. He's talking about how there's new semiconductor companies being built here and, you know, how things are, you know, the, the, the employ employment numbers are still good, et cetera. Putting out facts. Scott Wapner kept saying he lives in a fantasy world and Scott Wapner coming up with stuff that I thought was fantasy. But putting down guests like that and just creating this negative uh, narrative scares the shit out of people. And you start thinking to yourself, it's like a bad commercial here over and over. And eventually you start thinking it. It's like when you tell a lie, if you tell enough times, you start believing it. When people start telling you bullshit over and over, you start believing the BS. And, and I feel like that, especially with social media and, and the fact that we're so tied to our phones and our computers and the world, the more we keep putting out and out, th this is a bit of a self-inflicted negativity environment where we have here. Yes, things aren't always going to be great, but why don't we look ahead? The fact that, you know what? Inflation's high, but wages are up over 5% year over year. And eventually inflation will come down. And when inflation comes down, do you think your boss is going to say, I'm going to take back that raise? No, that's not how the world works. So eventually that, that your wages will outpace inflation. Yeah, it's tough right now. I'm not trying to pretend it's not tough. It is. My point, though, is, is, is we're not thinking big picture. We're looking at tomorrow instead of looking at next year or three years from now. If you think you have a week left to live, then F it. Yeah, who cares? Be negative, whatever. Actually, you probably should enjoy it. But let's be realistic. We have to look out. And this negativity is just, it's, it has to be my rant today because I'm sick of hearing it. And if you hate the market so much and you think it's scammed, then don't go in it. Sit on cash and make your 1% and be happy. But don't put anybody else down because they don't agree with you. And I'm not putting Scott Walton down because I don't agree with him. I'm putting him down because he didn't give his, his guest a fair shot. And that's the, the, the downside to what they call journalism at CNBC. It's absolutely embarrassing as an ex-journalist to see what they do. All right, so speaking of consumer, let's talk about the consumer. And I found some stocks here that I think regardless if we have a shallow recession, regardless of the bear market, regardless of inflation, should continue to do well. So we're going to pull up here, number one. These are no specific order, no buy or sell recommendations, but I want to show these to you. The first one I'm showing you here is Chewy, C-H-W-Y. If you own a pet, which I feel is like most people in the world, or in this country, I should say, um, then you probably heard of Chewy. It's a $17.5 billion company. It's the largest e-commerce pet retailer in the United States. Uh, it was founded in 2011 and then bought by PetSmart in 2017. And then they rolled it out and took it public in 2019. Uh, pet food, treats, meds, uh, everything from crates to leashes, you name it, anything you can get from there. You can see here in the chart, it's still in a downtrend going back from August. Lower highs, lower lows. But if we zoom out a little bit more, we can see here it's, it's at this bottom. Very important double bottom. Since it went public, as I mentioned, in 2019, it pulled back to the low 20s, ran up to 120. Back to the low 20s, we're at 4152 uh, right now. So we're up basically about 85, 90% from the lows. But I still think there's much more upside here for Chewy. Uh, so Chewy... As I mentioned, $17.5 billion company. They had revenue in 2020 of $4.84 billion, jumped up last year 7.41. This year, looking for 8.9. So this is a situation where I've talked about this a lot, where stocks pull back. This one pulled back from 120 down to the low 20s as revenue continued to go higher. Revenue by 2024, which is two years from now, looking for $13.3 billion. 
So that means in four years, revenue is going from 4.8 to 13.3. That's some pretty darn good uh, top line growth. Uh, so it gives about a price of sales based on the next 12 months of 1.5, which is cheap, cheaper than the overall market. And then we look at earnings. It's not turning a profit until 2024, where they expect an annual profit of 28 cents. So what happened here at Chewy, in my opinion, is anything that's not making a profit now got crushed. But again, look for the path to profitability, P2P, path to profitability. If they have that, that is that wipes it out and you're trading at a nice valuation based on revenue, which is growing dramatically. So this is one, again, I put right on my watch list. Another stock that's, uh, these are all over the place, folks, just so you know, that I talked about last week when Jonah Lupton was on is Crocs. And I did a little bit of a deeper dive into it. And again, I think they could be the ugliest looking shoes out there. And no offense to the many people out there who own them, the millions of people who own them. Uh, but Crocs is a $3.4 billion company. Uh, as you can see here in a chart, it's gotten hit. It was above 180. We were below 50 just two weeks ago. Now we're at 5480 uh, right now. But it's kind of been building a bit of a base. So again, you look at the growth of this. Uh, revenue in 2020, folks, $1.38 billion. Last year, 2.31. This year, looking for 3.5. And then by 2024, looking for about $4.4 billion. Again, going from approximately $1.4 billion in 2020 Four years later, $4.4 billion. During a shutdown, during a recession, during a bear market, that is good. Making big money, too. Uh, in 2021, last year, it made $8.32 a share. This year, looking for $10.50. And by 2024, over 12 bucks a share. So you're seeing good top-line growth, good bottom-line growth. This is what's crazy. And this is kind of what scares me. The forward PE ratio is 4.7. The forward price of sales is 0.85. Both extremely cheap. Cheap, if it was a utility, it'd be cheap. Very, very cheap. So it says to me, is there something that I'm missing here? Is there something wrong with this company and why it's trading? Sometimes they call that a value trap. I don't know. Uh, I might be wrong, I might be right, but it's attractive and it's tough to ignore. And as Jonah talked about last week, the kids love them. And if the kids like it, the parents buy it. And, you know, it's, it's tough to argue with that. So another one you may want to throw on there. The next one starts with a C as well. I don't know why these all start with Cs, if what that means is uh, Vita Coco, the symbol is C-O-C-O. This is a $640 million company, and it makes uh, coconut water. As you probably see, I love drinking coconut water, especially you get dehydrated really quickly down here. Uh, and in Nicaragua, I'm down there, I drink a ton of coconut water. That happens to come out of a real coconut, but I do like it. It makes coconut water. It also white labels a lot of it. It has two other brands called Run, and the other one's called Ever and Ever. So 2020 at 310 million sales, last year 379, this year 450, and by 2024, 570 million. So you can see big growth on the top line. It is profitable. Uh, last year's uh, earnings per share of 50 cents. This year dipping a bit to 33, back to 56 next year and back up to 75 in 2024. Forward P ratio 20, price of sales about 1.2. You can see here in the chart, it bottomed out in March and it's really starting an uptrend, which you see is very rare these days, but higher lows, and higher highs. If this trend continues, it means the stock comes up to around 1450, which is three bucks from here, which is about 25%. So you can see th this, this looks pretty good. And, and again, it's a smaller company, only about $640 million, but this is the kind of company that's been growing through recession, through bear market, which is what you want to see. Now we're going to go to the to a big guy. And this is a stock that got crushed as of late. They came out with earnings in March and missed and they guided lower and it's been unable to really rebound from that. And that's one of the largest retailers in the country. And that is uh, Target or some people call it Target, similar TGT. But a $68 billion company, folks, stock fell nearly 50% uh, down to where it is right now. Uh, at the end of 2021, it had over 1,900 stores and... Um, during the uh, right now, they have about 19 percent of their sales come from online, which is nice and which really helps the margins. It was about nine percent in 2018. So it's pre pandemic. So we've seen a lot more go that way. They also own a company called Shipt, S-H-I-P-T. They do same day delivery. It's a platform for that. You might I get tons of emails from that, maybe because I'm on a target email list. Uh, so let's take a look at the numbers here. 2020, 78 billion in revenue. 2021, 93.5. This fiscal year, 106, and then 110, 115. So the growth is slowing. That's a concern. The biggest concern, though, is on the bottom line. Because 2020, there was earnings per share of 636. 2021, $8.64. 2022, $14.10. And then 
And then 2023 expected to drop to 862 before rebounding to 1230 uh, in 2024. So revenue growth uh, continues, but earnings have been hurt. Gross margins decreased. And, and this is, you know, the company said it's, it's pretty well known in May, um, you know, higher expenses. And they have a lot of inventory they're trying to get rid of. Uh, so they're selling it at lower prices, which means lower margins, which means that the bottom line, which is the profit, will be less. So let's say you bought uh, a, a toy car for $10. Normally you sell it for $25. You're making $15 bucks on it, but you want to get rid of it. Now you're selling for $15. You're only making 5 bucks on it. So it's going to hurt your margins, obviously, and hurt that profit. That profit went from $15 down to 5 That's a big difference. So that's a big reason you're seeing that. However, looking out um, forward, you can see a uh, P.E. ratio of 12, price to sales of 0.59. It's cheap. However, I want to see them come out with one, one quarter, the next quarter, which would obviously be, if this was in May, it would be in August, coming up in about a month from now. Uh, start saying something a little bit better. I'd rather pay a little more for it than try to catch the bottom down here, though it has been building a base, which is a good sign for it. Uh, but it's, it's one you want to keep an eye on. The one thing I find fascinating is, they're saying they have too much inventory of some things. They have to get rid of it because they, you know, they had the, the, the port issue, supply chain issue. So they ordered a lot. A lot came. Demand didn't keep up with it uh, after the recession. But then you, the, at the other breath, the bears say that the supply chain still messed up, that people can't get inventory. So I, I, sometimes it's tough to believe what they even, you even hear. Uh, I got uh, three more here for you. And this one, the next two kind of counteract with each other. This one it got a great chart, and it's Hostess brand, symbols TWNK. And obviously, TWNK is short for Twinkie. Hostess Brands makes Twinkie. It's about a $3 billion company. Second largest provider of sweet baked goods in the U.S. Uh, is Hostess Brands. They have Twinkies, Ding Dongs, Ho-Hos, and of course, the old Hostess Cupcakes. I wanted to get one for you today, but I even know where to buy one. Um, they also recently moved into the breakfast and cookie categories. Uh, they bought two other companies since they just went public again. Uh, you know, they were in uh, bankruptcy and they came back out of bankruptcy in 2000 and I think it was, I'm looking back here, 2016, I think they came back out a couple years later. Uh, but now it's, it, it's, as you can see here, the charts are uh, doing great. And um, sales of 2021, 1.1 billion, they should looking for 1.3. So you're not seeing big, big growth on the top side. Uh, bottom line, looking for about 88 cents per share this year, up to buck 24 in 2024. But nice valuation, 19 PE, two price of sales. So again, just kind of want to show you something out there uh, that's a little different uh, and that's been actually holding up in this market. And then we go over to uh, what we would call more healthy food. And this is a Simply Good Foods company, symbol SMPL. A little bit bigger in Hostess, about $3.7 billion company. And this concentrates on low-carb, high-protein food, uh, really two brands, the Atkins brand, which is obviously based off the Atkins diet and the Quest food brand. And I got to tell you, I ordered these and because I, I thought they were Atkins protein bars. But I got to say, I ordered these and they're the Atkins Indulge. You get these. It's like it's like a peanut butter cup, but it's only got 80 calories in each one. Uh, the sugar is not that bad. Only uh, zero sugar actually included. It's got 7% of your fiber for the day. And I got to tell you, they taste just like a peanut butter cup, but much, much healthier. And that's made by Simple Foods here. Uh, 2020, they had revenue of $816 million. This year, looking for $1.15, $1.34 by 2022. Bottom line, uh, made $1.26 last year, looking for $1.42 this year, $1.77 by 2024. So nice bottom line growth. PE ratio 23, price of sales 2.9. But again, you go back to the chart here real quick. This has actually held up really well on a bottom line of support around 35 right now versus the market. Uh, you know, this this began the year at around 42. It's at 36. So again, it's holding, holding up much better than, than the overall market. One more stock, and this is a bit of an indulgent stock as well. And I happen to like some of their brands on it. This is a Diageo, symbol D-E-O. It's about a $107 billion company. And it's uh, known for a couple of things. Uh, it's Kettle One Vodka, Captain Morgan Rum, uh, Crown Royal, Johnny Walker. Uh, uh, in tequila, they make uh, Casamigos and Don Julio. Uh, Guinness, obviously we all know Guinness, uh, the uh, beautiful Irish uh, beer. Uh, they also make uh, Bullet Bourbon, which I like, Lagavulin, which is my favorite scotch, Bailey's Irish Cream. Uh, so quite a bit. They have wine. They own 30% of Moet Hennessy, which is champagne and cognac. They own 55% of United Spirits. Uh, which is a uh, alcohol distributor in India. So let's take a look at a chart here. 
not the best looking chart. I, I will say that, but let's look at the long term one and kind of show you an idea. You know, that, that's over a couple of years and this is the real long term. It tends to have dips. And boy, if you bought these long term dips and they last quite a bit of time, if you buy these, they end up being really great buying opportunities for you over the long term. So Diageo, as I mentioned, about $107 billion company, they had a, uh, they dipped down to $14.8 billion in 2020 because uh, some of the sales, obviously, even though uh, people were buying during recession, they weren't going out to bars as much. Uh, then we had $17.14 billion last year, this year um, looking to increase, and then up to about $21 billion by 2024. The, this year, looking for $7.28 a share, up to 940 by 2024. P.E. ratio, 18.3. So again, not a bad number. Price of sales a little bit higher at 5.2. But again, these are consumer brands. You think about Diageo. Uh, it's alcohol. Recession or not, you probably drink. Uh, simple goods. You maybe cut that back because it's a little more expensive, but people who are into health are into health regardless. Uh, Twinkies, you know, if you're going to indulge, you can indulge. I don't think it really matters. Target, Target, this is kind of an outlier, bigger company, but as I said, uh, it's it's got some upside potential here. You may want to give it a quarter. Uh, Vita Coco has been doing well through this. Uh, Crocs, it has that brand. Chewy, your pet, you're not cutting out your pet if things start getting crazy. So overall, folks, all these cover a little bit of a different basis. All have some good, all have a little bad. Nothing's perfect with these stocks. Again, not buy or sell. Put them on your watch list. If it's something you like, do a little bit more research into it. But I like to share ideas that come up as my team and I go through different sectors. And uh, our um, Mega Trend Investor newsletter goes out next Wednesday, and they're actually recommending a new portfolio. We're calling it the e-commerce logistics portfolio because e-commerce continues to take more market share. And if you look at the numbers, uh, according to um, uh, the government, we're only about 14% penetration for e-commerce. And that is going to get much higher uh, over the, the roaring 2020s and beyond. So how do you do that? Well, you can invest in e-commerce companies, whether it's uh, that companies actually sell, whether it's they create the platforms and logistics, because the more you buy online, more has to be delivered. So logistics starts with me in the warehouse, uh, robotics, everything from there getting out to the trucks, the trucks getting into you, maybe it's drones in a couple of years, whatever it might be. That's a very important part of e-commerce. So we're launching that portfolio next Wednesday. Two very small cap stocks we're putting in there. You guarantee you never heard of them. Uh, one's a logistics play and one's an e-commerce play coming out. So if you're interested in that, obviously, there's always links you can click throughout the the, uh, the podcast here. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and let me know why you're so damn negative. And if you're not, let me know why you're positive. I'd actually even like to know that even more than why you're negative. But again, folks, the sun's shining, at least here. If you have your health, you have your family, you can put food on the table. You obviously are watching this. You're interested in the market and the economy. Life's always better than you think. So keep your head up, smile, give somebody a hug, and it's spread that. It's good. Let them know life's okay and things will get better. We've struggled through a lot worse and we probably will again in the future. But let's keep our heads up, keep it going, stay positive. And again, when it comes to the market, it will come back. Trust me, it has forever. And it will again. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Matt McCall, and that was Making Money. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.